Welcome to another episode of Reckless Ideas. My name's Chris Thompson. I'm the executive director, for now, of Generator. Uh, and Reckless Ideas is a collaboration between the Conflict Systems Group up at UVN with Juniper Lovato and, uh, where's Robin? It's Robin. And Robin from the Complex of the uh, Emergent Media Center at Champlain College. We are actually in Champlain College's flex space right now. My sincere thanks to the college. Uh, this space allows us to do fantastic events like this, and uh, it's a wonderful collaboration. I'd like to also thank our two sponsors, uh, the Mayor's Office of the City of Burlington. They've been very generous, uh, as well as Hula, our local neighbors uh, in innovation. So we're excited to have both of them here. Tonight, I'm excited. So this is actually, we're kicking off the fall season of Reckless Ideas right now. Remember, Reckless Ideas is a speaker series focused on folks who particularly are at the intersection of different disciplines and taking chances and breaking things and getting messy. Wasn't that Miss Frizzle? I can't remember. Anyway, so, um, but tonight I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Paul Hines. He is... Uh, the professor of engineering at UVM. He is a member of the Complex Systems Center, Juniper. Uh, Paul is also the CEO and co-founder of Packetized Energy, a company that works to provide the most effective, affordable, and user-friendly solutions to enable electric, electric, electrical supply and demand to balance on the grid in real time. Paul's reckless idea for this evening is your water heater will save the world. Paul. So, uh, so I have you have the luxury of 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 a problem helping me to solve a problem. So I've been giving uh, pitches about my company for quite a while, and I have to always do it in like five minutes. And and so I had to figure out how do I take what's now a five minute pitch and extend it into a whole you know forty five minutes. So hopefully I, I, I mostly you know let me know if this is getting boring and I should just stop <laughs> at any time. So. Um, so we, how is your water heater going to save the world? I'm going to try to answer that question and answer a lot of other related things first. But I want to start with, um, well, first I've got to do this. So, so I am at the University of Vermont. I also own equity in, the, in, the, uh, in this company, Pactize Energy. Um, and a lot of these ideas came from collaborations with my co-founders, Jeff Froelich and Masson Osalki, and a whole team of students and a whole awesome staff of people at Pactize. And they get way more credit than I do. Um, okay, so let's start with a story that I think probably if you showed up to this talk, you probably already know this story. Uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, methane, CO2, nitrous oxides, all sorts of other stuff is getting into the atmosphere that's creating this blanket, which is warming the atmosphere and causing all sorts of really strange things. My favorite term for this is uh, coined by Catherine Hayhoe that uh, which is global weirding. So the, the globe's atmosphere is just getting really weird as a result of emissions that have uh, been produced by, you know, primarily by human activities. Um, these are projections based on the, from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, saying where are temperatures going? And based on different scenarios, you get somewhere between a one degree rise in temperature and a five degree or six degree rise in temperature. I mean that in, in you know, increasing temperatures by five degrees Celsius would be an unfathomable disaster. I mean, the, the planet cannot support life as we know it in the ordinary way with, that, uh, with those temperatures. All sorts of crazy things happen. So this is a big deal. We need to figure this out. But there's a really, really positive story on the other side of that. So uh, you know, this is, I, I think, you know, this is from BP. So BP is not an environmental group, as you probably know. Um, and, and, you know, their, their job is not to tell you that, that uh, you know, oil is going to be displaced. But they do a really great job of presenting energy data every year through this thing called the BP Statistical Review. And every year they put out, you know, an enormous amount of data with really cool charts. And I think this is my world, you know, my favorite chart in the whole world. This is just absolutely incredible. So this is the amount of non-hydro renewable energy production, which is basically wind and solar. So this is how much wind and solar energy that's produced. Now you see a lot of charts that are similar that are based on how much 
capacity we've built, which is similar, but this one's the one that's really important. How much actual energy was produced by wind and solar plants over time? And you know that number is is such that now it's it's getting up toward 10% of global uh, global energy supply in a lot of countries around the world, um, and that that rate of increase that is an exponential rate of increase. That's a factor of 10 increase in a period of 10 years. If that happened again, we could solve the world's energy problems. And so if we can continue this exponential rise in um, in uh, in energy production. I mean, it, literally, we could solve all of the world's energy problems with a few caveats that we're going to talk about. So wind and solar are growing absolutely like crazy. They are the fastest growing sources of electricity worldwide. They are now cheap. People are building these things not because they want to save the world, but because they actually are just making a ton of money which is where we want to be. Like, we need people to be building these plants because they're making money. Um, otherwise, they won't do it. I mean, that's sort of the facts of life. Um, and, and it's happening. And so people all over the country are building um, uh, wind and solar like crazy. If, anyone want to guess where the most uh, wind production is in the country? State. Nope. Nope. Texas. Texas. So Texas, you know, you would think of and here in Vermont, we love to diss Texas. I was just in Texas. There are a lot of amazingly um, amazing people who love renewable energy, and it's making them a ton of money, and it's making the system work better. And so wind and solar energy are growing. It's, uh, it's going to do amazing things. And it's also super messy. So, you know, when we turn on a coal or a nuclear plant, which is basically how we've been running the electricity system for the last uh, 100 years, they're really boring. I mean, you turn the plant on, and it just does exactly what you tell it to do, and nothing interesting happens until you turn it off again. Um, it's, it's really nothing interesting happens with coal and nuclear plants. You know, this, is data from, uh, this is data from some work we did a while back looking at uh, the power output from, this is a, not just one wind plant, but like all of the wind plants in the Columbia River Basin and Washington State. Uh, so the black line is, uh, is the amount of wind power produced from all of the wind plants along the Columbia River, River Gorge and, you know, a few years back. And, uh, and it goes up and down like crazy. Uh, you know, you're, you know, all of the things that we do to turn lights on and off and, and me speaking in this microphone is causing electricity usage to happen. And that's happening in a completely different time domain pattern than this, this wind flux fluctuations. And so now we've got a problem. So the wind is coming and going whenever it wants to based on, you know, whatever that's happening on the weather system. So this is basically two other sets of data. Uh, this is, uh, this was, the red line, ignore the red line, it's not relevant here. But uh, the, so the red line was like, if you tried to guess that it was a natural Gaussian process, you get it all wrong. And so this was kind of a nerdy paper we had written a while back. Um, wind does funky stuff, and it's really hard to balance a grid when your power plants are just doing whatever they want to all day. That's the main point. Really hard to run a grid when that's what your power plants are doing. Next, solar. You think about solar like, oh, it's sunny during the day and, and shady at night. Maybe this solar is better. So this is a, a, a large solar plant in Arizona on a semi-cloudy day. And it is producing power and, and consuming power like crazy through the day. So its power output is fluctuating um, in ways that you wouldn't expect. And, and what's interesting is like it, it actually, there's these little peaks up here that happen. So when a cloud comes over a solar plant, there's a the it actually the um, it amplifies the light slightly, right? The moment before and after the cloud goes by, and so the power will actually shoot up for a moment and then shoot way down, you know, down to the you know almost no production after that cloud passes. And so now we've got these giant solar plants that are being built all over the country, and you see them here in Vermont. Um, but the, you know, the world is even covered with these things. And they are doing all sorts of weird stuff on the grid. So I was, spent the day yesterday <coughs> at Velco, which is the people who run the grid for Vermont. And um, 
we've been working with them to develop some software that helps them understand what's going to happen to their grid. And they are completely freaked out because you start putting enough of these things in their network, all of a sudden, all the power is going to be sloshing on around all over the place, and the system is not going to work right. And so the question is, if wind and solar are going to grow like this for the next 10 years, and their power output is going to look like this, and, uh, and one additional detail that we have to notice. So, you know, if I were to, um, you know, so I'm a, I pretend I'm a farmer. I, I wish I was a farmer, but I'm not a farmer. But, I, but pretend I am. If I were a farmer and my cows produced too much milk on one day and too little milk on the next day, it's really not that big of a deal because we store milk on the shelf. Um, but electricity is different. With electricity, the moment that I actually, you know, the moment I shut the lights off in this room, if I were to do it, I don't know where light switches, but, but if I were to do it, some power plant somewhere has to actually decrease its output by a little tiny bit in order to compensate that. And if it doesn't, the whole thing spins wildly out of control and the grid fails. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, if I switch the light back on, some power plant somewhere has to then ramp up just a little bit. And if that doesn't happen within, uh, within about a second or two, the whole system will break. And so we've got this system in which we're, it's super fragile. It's constantly trying to figure out how to keep this balance between supply and demand. And we're adding these crazy amounts of variable wind and solar to the system. How are we going to do it? Next thing, before we get to that, is to say that we've got to do it. So, um, so this is, uh, if you look at the Paris Climate Accords, a lot of times they think about these uh, climate mitigation wedges. So if we do nothing, uh, if we do nothing, you know, climate, uh, global CO2 emissions will continue to rise and we'll get to some crazy amount of global warming. It should be really quite, it'll be very weird. Um, and, uh, and, and if we, uh, you know, do a bunch of energy efficiency, we reforest the Amazon, a lot of things like that. that. That could solve a lot of problems. But really, like half of the amount of work that we have to do to solve the problem of too much CO2 in the, in the, in the globe is going to come from wind and solar. So how much wind and solar do we have to build in order to do this? So for context, first, it's useful to know that like all of the electricity consumption across the whole globe is about three terawatts or 3,000 gigawatts or like uh, 3,000 large nuclear power plants. Like Vermont Yankee was a 600 megawatt plant. It was a small nuclear power plant. You know, an ordinary big nuclear power plant is, uh, is, is a gigawatt, 1,000 megawatts. So we have about 3,000 of those, like the global electricity demand is about 3,000 of those running at the same time, all the time, all year round. Um, in order to get this amount of reduction that we need here to meet the Paris Climate Accords, we need um, 10 terawatts of time-varying renewables. So that's like three times the global average um, demand of, of wind and solar. And what, why you need so much is because wind and solar don't, uh, don't blow and shine all the time. So the sun, sun is only shining, you know, on average about 15% of the day if you average over the day. Uh, the wind is only blowing about, you know, based on the power plant production, about 30% of the day, around the day. Um, and so we need to build a lot of these plants because you're going to have to sort of use some and not others. And so we need an enormous amount of this stuff. Um, and so now we've got all an enormous amount of this wind and solar, and they're doing whatever they want to do. In order to balance them, we need about nine terawatts of other stuff that's going to help balance that supply and demand. And the question is, what do we build in order to help balance the grid when we get to this point um, in 2050? And what if we don't? Well, this is uh, a good example of what happens if we don't. So if we don't build something to fix this problem, um, we'll, we're, the grid's going to fail. So uh, only about so a, couple, a couple months ago, um, a large wind plant offshore in the North Sea in, uh, in England uh, failed all of a sudden, surprisingly. Um, and they didn't expect it. 
that triggered another power plant failure, and then all of a sudden, everybody in London had no power. Um, the, the tube failed, every, everybody was stuck underground, um, and, and you know, the grid couldn't handle that, that loss, sudden loss of power. And so we've got a system that's really fragile. If we don't fix it, we're gonna be in big trouble. So what do we do? Well, the way that everybody is thinking by, about this by default is that we should build absolutely gargantuan amounts of batteries. So um, batteries are, uh, are a big deal. Um, companies like Tesla are installing batteries here in Vermont. Uh, Vermont-based companies like Northern Power Systems is building these things. And they're building, I mean, these are basically, you know, lots of D-sized battery cells all stuck into, you know, 19-inch computer racks, uh, stacked high and put into these enormous buildings um, of, of batteries. So that's one option. We can build batteries. Batteries are useful. They have the ability to store energy for a time that might be better. Um, but man, they're expensive. It is incredibly expensive. We would basically, you know, triple the cost of building that amount of renewable energy if we have to build enough batteries to store all that renewable energy at the same time. So that's going to be really costly. Um, Despite the fact that batteries are super expensive, uh, we are building batteries like crazy. So uh, this is a report by Navigant, which is a group in the industry that studies what's happening. And they, they looked at um, different regions around the world. They looked at state goals for how much energy storage uh, will need to be built in order to meet certain state goals. And we're gonna build you know, 36 gigawatts, so 36 giant nuclear power plants worth of new battery systems uh, by 2025 if people actually meet the state goals that the states have set out. So, uh, so, so maybe that's the way things are gonna go. We're just gonna build an enormous amount of batteries. But now I wanna ask a what if question. So this room right here, this room has a lot of stored energy. So all of us are, are, are sitting in a room that's got uh, thermal mass, so the air is holding a certain amount of energy, um, and, uh, and the water heater that provides the hot water in the bathroom has a lot of stored energy, and <clears throat> the EVs that are connected, there's probably an EV charger outside, those EVs have a lot of stored energy. There is an enormous amount of stored energy in the buildings and the appliances that you and I are using every day. So things that I'm particularly interested in are water heaters, EV chargers, thermostats that are running the temperatures in rooms, um, heat pumps that are being installed to replace people's boilers, uh, you know, all the refrigerators and grocery stores and, and uh, and you know, grocery stores around the world, batteries that are, people are installing just because they wanna have a backup power source, uh, pool pumps, there are about three giant nuclear power plants worth of pool pumps in Florida alone. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, irrigation pumps, the you know, entire mid Midwest is, is, uh, you know, consumes an enormous amount of energy just for irrigation pumps. Um, so all of these things, have, have two things in common. One, they don't necessarily need to use or produce their energy at any one particular point in time. They're flexible. They can be moved, their energy usage or production can be moved in time a little bit. And really, you know, for most of it, nobody notices. Like if, if the air conditioner for this room had been on 10 minutes ago, but not now, nobody in this room would notice. Like that, that small change in time uh, would not affect our comfort because there's stored energy in the room. We, there's inertia in the system. Same thing with a pool pump. Like if I, my pool pump runs uh, you know, in funny hours in the middle of the night, but not during the day, I don't really care as long as my pool goes clean you know, when, my, when I have a pool party next week. I don't have a pool, but I wish I did. <laughs> Some days, not really. Um, so so you know, all of these things are flexible. And so what if we could figure out how to transform all of these devices into energy storage in some way that would actually solve the problem? And so that's what we do. So that's uh, Packetized Energy is a software platform that transforms connected energy appliances into energy storage, uh, valuable energy storage. And so 
The way we do that is we've got a, a software platform for electric utilities that helps them manage aggregate assets um, as if they were a battery. We have a, an app that helps you know, uh, people who sign up for our programs um, to better manage their energy appliances, get better information, and help set, change their settings, and they get some money for participating. We have a bunch of IoT devices, like this one on the right is, is, is called the Mellow, and it's a smart appliance for your water heater. I'll talk about water heaters in a, in a minute here. Um, and so by basically building a platform that connects people, their energy appliances, with the electric utility in a way that's valuable to everybody, we can, uh, we can solve this problem of energy storage at way less cost than it's gonna cost us to build uh, that many batteries. How are we gonna do it? The way that we're gonna do it is by using algorithms that run the internet. So, you know, that when I make a phone call on my phone, it gets divided, you know, my voice then gets divided into small energy pack, or into data packets. Those packets get routed through the internet um, using uh, a lot of strategic coin flipping or randomization. And so we take those, those two core ideas of dividing things into manageable chunks or packets and strategic uh, coin flipping and use those same ideas to run millions of small energy devices rather than trying to do things in a very traditional way. So the way that utilities have traditionally solved this problem is by uh, you know, gather all the data from all the power plants and then optimize the heck out of them and tell them what to do. This is sort of very top-down approach to solving problems, which is, you know, utilities are, are used to that. But in order to manage, you know, billions of, of energy devices, we need a distributed approach. Yeah. Um, if you could give the example. So let's say I've got an electric vehicle. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, under your scan, I enthusiastically sign up for it. Yep. What are the demands or changes? Yeah. I find that my laundry cuts off in the middle, or I only do your car. So I'm not going to mess with your laundry because you you want to run your laundry when you want to do it. I'm not going to mess with your TV, like things things that you want to turn on and it and you it works at that point in time. I'm not going to mess with those. But like your water heater, all you care about is that you've got enough water so that when you turn it on, it's there. Right. So what we do with water heaters uh, is is basically. You know, people typically set their water heater about 130. We let it float between 140 and 120. People really don't notice the difference, and there's actually a valve on the top that's going to mix it with some cold water anyways, so you're never going to notice that anything is happening in that range. So by, but by allowing it to float between 120 and 140 Fahrenheit, we get about 2 kilowatt hours of energy storage, so which is like $1,000 worth of energy storage. So you know how this transparent to me, or, or Yeah. You never notice that we're, anything's happening. But I will require your software yep. to be installed on some device connected to my right. to the utility and to my heater. That's right. And so we will just send energy back. Yeah. So in the end, we hope that this the the vision is that this will be a you know a phone app that you push a button and then you never think about it again. You probably forgot that you, that you got it and it shows up in a line in utility bill that you're getting five bucks a month for participating, but you never notice that this is happening. I mean, you've, you know, every once in a while you might pull out the phone app and say, oh, well, look, I saved 50 bucks last year. That's pretty cool. Um, but other than that, it's not something that you should care, because you've got better things to do with your time than to worry about your water here. So the first thing you need to do is to sell this to the utilities, who then offer this to their clients and sufficient. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we are working on a number of different business models. We're working not only with utilities, but also with companies like Efficiency Vermont that are energy efficiency implementers, because they're realizing that their business model of just convincing people to use fewer kilowatt hours doesn't actually work anymore. So that if, if kilowatt hours are free because they're produced by wind and solar in the middle of the day when those things are overly plentiful, why should we be convincing people to use fewer of them? Doesn't really, we should find some good to do with those kilowatt hours rather than telling people to not use them. So all of these companies, Efficiency Vermont is super innovative, uh, great friends there. But so they are now running the system. So we're working with those types of companies. If the water yep. heater specifically is used as the storage of energy, how do you reverse that? You need to have yeah, so we don't. We're not actually going to extract heat out of the system, but I don't have to, which is because you're going to take a shower. 
So, uh, so the, the end effect is that we're moving the average usage of a giant fleet of these devices around a baseline and, um, and people use their, their devices um, based on their normal usage patterns. We just change the power. And to the grid operators, it looks exactly the same. So, question, you had. Uh, it, it was answered during your Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so that's what we do. We turn uh, connected energy appliances into virtual batteries. Um, and uh, and the, you know, right now we're using a lot of our own, own IoT devices, so this is the device on the right is, is a Mellow uh, smart thermostat created in part by, uh, by a generator member, Andrew Drove, probably many of you know. Um, and, and so it was designed uh, here in Vermont, um, and that device uh, helps to change a dumb appliance into a smart one. We're also working with a number of existing appliance manufacturers to incorporate our software into their stuff. So. Um, okay, so this, now I'm going to kind of do a little bit of technical stuff, but I'm happy to take questions before I do. Yeah. Um, so what is the response time that's necessary in order for this to work? Like how do you yeah. guarantee that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
by based on whatever whatever it is that people are doing with their water, uh, we turn our system on and the supply and dem demand all of a sudden align really, really well. And so, you know, through these simple ideas of packetization and randomization, we turn a fleet of water heaters into something that can track with the ups and downs of renewable energy in real time in a way that really hasn't been done before. Um, so, you know, this was simulation data. Does it work in the real world? Yeah, so the real world is a little messier than simulation data. This is only 150 devices. This, the pre former one was 300. Uh, but yeah, it works. So here's the signal from the grid and the light blue and the dark blue is the actual behavior in real time from a whole bunch of these water heaters. And so we're telling them to go up and then go down, go up, go down. Um, and they're doing it. So yeah, it's a little <coughs> random and weird, but that's okay. There's lots of smoothing effects in the grid. We're now able to turn what was uh, you know, a bunch of devices that are doing their own thing into a valuable resource that can actually solve problems on the grid. Um, okay, so we, we uh, finished our initial project with RPE and it really worked quite well. One of the, my favorite results is that we found that diversity is good. Uh, we all knew that to start, um, but we initially were looking at just water heaters and then we sort of said, what happens if we add EVs into the mix? What happens if we add um, add uh, batteries and other types of devices, we found that by adding a diverse fleet of devices, we end up with better results than we would have gotten from any one of those alone. So in the, in the blue, we've got, uh, or sorry, in the black, uh, this is the performance we got from water heaters alone. In the red is what we would have liked them to do um, based on what was happening on the grid. And so the water heaters honestly didn't do very well. I mean, they kind of failed to track with our signal in a number of different places. We mixed together a diverse resource, and now we're able to get this uh, really pretty incredible tracking behavior. And so, so we found that by mixing different types of devices in the, uh, together, we get really good results. So now we've got EVs run, working in the field, we've got batteries working in the field, and a number of other devices that are coming soon. Uh, so another thing that we need to be able to do in order for this to act as a battery is to estimate how much energy is stored in the system. And so we've um, a lot of detail here that we don't need to go into, but we've basically now developed these algorithms that can estimate how much stored energy I have in a large fleet of these devices based on what they're doing. Um, we developed this cyber-physical test bed at UVM that allows us to do a lot of testing that's pretty cool. Um, and we did the field trial with, uh, you know, we've got two or 300 of these devices uh, deployed now across Vermont, um, and they're working in the real world to actually solve problems. You can actually see that we're, this, this was, we had some criteria that we had to meet uh, from RPE, and, and we were able to meet the criteria that they had set out for us, so it was really good. Um, so, successful project, RPE was really happy, um, and, and, and that was really great. Um, okay, so the last topic I have, I think, for tonight is I want to talk about what do we do with these things. So now we've got this resource, we've got this battery and, uh, that's made of all sorts of devices that are distributed across the grid. What do we do with them? So we're working on four different grid services right now. Um, that are really valuable to electricity industry. So one is avoiding the need to build new generators. So if we can um, take that solar resource and kind of move it around so that it's meeting those peak loads, um, we can avoid the need to build new generators. Really, really valuable because this is super expensive. Almost as expensive as building new transmission lines. So building new transmission distribution infrastructure um, is extremely valuable. So Con Edison, which is a big utility in New York City, um, recently had a problem in the Brooklyn, Queens area where they were going to have to spend like $1.2 billion to upgrade one substation that fed that region. Um, and they, they realized that they could spend only a few hundred million dollars on this type of technology um, <laughs> and avoid that billion dollar investment. And so so we're developing tools that are helping utilities to avoid those types of investments. Um, we've got a tool that, that follows, that's basically kind of trading stocks with energy, which is kind of cool. So just like with you know, stocks, there is a real-time market for electricity. 
and it's run by an organization here in New England called ISO New England. Um, and every five minutes, there's a new price for a uh, new market price for energy. So we were actively monitoring those wholesale prices and uh, increasing and decreasing the demand based on that price. And that helps to smooth out the grid, and it also saves the utilities and the ultimately you a lot of money. Um, and then we're working on a new tool that can. Uh, I'm sorry, you're doing this with it. So we do market. it as a service to the utility. So the so it's a software as a service deal with the utility. So the so utility is pay, doing the arbitrage. You pay for the ease you're giving to your utility clients, not as an arbitrage. That's right. We are arbitraging, but we're doing it on their behalf. And is there a market, you know, post Enron and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Stuff for this technology to go straight. Time? In a, yes, in Texas, you can do it to some extent. So the, all the market rules are changing right now. So 2021, uh, most of the uh, US electricity markets will be open for us to go in and sell this service directly into the wholesale markets um, without the utility. If you had an evil financial person who's only interested in profits, mm -hmm. would you wreck the system with this or enhance the system with this? Uh, I won't say that it's impossible to come up with a way to wreck the system. I'm sure that clever people will ultimately find a way to, uh, that is not our mission. <laughs> I mean, our mission is to do good. Uh, but no, I mean, it, you know, you, we are not going to be a large enough resource to do what Enron did for an enormous amount of time. Um, but it is something that the wholesale market operators are really looking at. If, if all of these distributed energy resources are bidding into the market, just like the power plants are bidding into the market, is that going to do weird things to the market? Um, and so they're, they're actively studying that. I don't think they have a good answer yet. So we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, so also getting into real-time grid balancing. I'll just really quickly mention a few of these things. So we've um, got this tool that we call Peak Crusher, which is really valuable to utilities. It's helping them to crush the peaks during these hours when electricity is super expensive. Uh, I always find it fascinating. So, you know, you and I pay about 10 cents, 15 cents per kilowatt hour per unit of electricity. On the peak summer day in Vermont, utilities pay about $125 for that 15 cent electricity. So in that one hour that is the most expensive hour of the year, they're going to pay $125 and then sell it to you for 15 cents. That's really bad business. Uh, I'm, you know, not a business person. I'm learning to be a business person, but... I even I know that. So, um, so that it's really interesting that that and and so as a result, they do all sorts of crazy things to try to convince you to use electricity uh, during that one peak summer hour. They kind of have to guess when it's going to happen because nobody knows when the most expensive hour of the year is going to be. Um, but you'll see programs like Burlington Electric has this program called I don't forget what they call it. But they they send out messages and they'll donate to charity if you reduce your load. And, um, and we've got a water heater program that's helping them and helping the GMP and helping Vermont Electric Co-op and a number of others around the country to reduce loads during their peak hours. Um, we're also doing this real-time energy arbitrage. So here's the you know, wholesale price of electricity. Um, and you know, here's a dip in the wholesale price. And we sort of shoot the load up during that, that expensive period. And so we're, we're doing this real-time arbitrage on the market. Um, and then there's also a service where you could actually sell the, the ability to track in real time with the ups and downs of the grid. So we're developing a tool where we can actually sell this service. A lot of batteries are selling the service right now, um, but there's a lot of m money to be made and value to be had, and it helps to smooth the renewable energies, which is really good. Um, so we're getting some other results, as I showed before, um, and they're promising more work to do on that space. Um, the last thing we're doing is we're taking a lot of technology that we've developed for modeling the grid and allowing the utilities to see, like I've, on this particular portion of the network, I've got this many resources and here's what those resources are doing. Because the utilities realize that all of these crazy devices are getting plugged in, you know, Nest and Ecobee are installing smart thermostats everywhere, but they have no visibility into what's happening. And like people have rooftop solar, they have very little visibility into rooftop solar. And so helping them to really understand what's happening in their network um, when things are changing so rapidly. Just to, to kind of wrap up, um, we've got an enormous amount of flexibility in the system. 
we need to figure out how to leverage all of that flexibility if we're going to solve the giant global uh, climate crisis that, that we're facing right now. And what's really cool is that Generator here has this you know, amazing group of people and, and set of facilities that are, you know, I think, training the next generation of IoT engineers. And so we would love to uh, continue to participate with Generator and with others to solve giant problems like, like uh, the coming of renewable energy. So the last note is that we do have an opening that will be opened up in, for a software engineer. So if someone, if you know an awesome software engineer, um, let me know. And, and I'm sure we'll have many openings for other positions in the not too distant future. Uh, that's it, questions? You said earlier that a diversified system yeah. um, allows you to better track the grid. Yeah. Uh, what about a diversified system allows you to better track that uh, the power grid? So it's it's really based on uh, the uh, that there are different time signatures to different types of devices. So you know, water heaters have this spike in load in the morning because people take their showers, and so that that's a, the big increase. Um, commercial HVAC systems have their big load during the daytime hours. Um, EVs have this spike in load in the evening when people plug in, and so. Um, if you average out all of those different types of time domain behaviors, you get something that's really nice and consistent, so you have flexibility all day round. Um, but if you just did one of those alone, you're not going to get um, the, that same level of flexibility. Yeah. Um, one of the issues that I've heard people run into with Internet of Things is that when the internet goes down, they stop being able to open their front door, for sure. example. Yes. What happens to your water heater if you if the internet goes yeah. down? Yeah. So so we have a, a very simple principle. Uh, don't build sucky stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, the the um, you know, a lot of the reason, I mean, IoT sucks. I mean, the, most of the, we have tested products from an enormous number of large manufacturers that you've heard of, and almost without exception, all of their stuff really, really sucks. And it's because they don't think about, you know, stupid things like making sure that it does something simple when the internet's not available. Like, uh, and this is what, I think we can actually learn something from the grid. So um, the, uh, not too many years ago, the Russians hacked into the Ukrainian power grid, and uh, the Ukrainian power grid did fine. And the reason is because it was based on, its de fundamental design was based on simple electromechanical principles. And so when the IT system failed, it went back to doing things the old way, and it did fine. And so, you know, I, we've been trying to design things with that simple principle. Like when, when you've got the internet available, you do sophisticated things. And when it's not, you go back to basic behavior. So that, you know, for water heater, it, it goes back to acting like a normal thermostat. So it should go back to acting just like your plain old water heater that you've become used to. Um, so I think that's it's a really good IoT design principle. Don't make it worse than the conventional product. Um, yeah. Um, can you estimate the impact that packetized has had so far? I guess to put it another way, how much have you packetized yeah. since you started? I mean, we've got um, it's so working. We're working with utilities, and they all start with pilot projects, and it's a very slow process. And so it's it's in the hundreds of devices. It's not in the thousands of devices, um, and so it's not the impact that it will be. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we certainly have ambitions to have enormous impact, but uh, um, it, it takes a lot of time to get through the pilot process with utilities. In your uh, study, field study, did, in the, uh, what you call them, grid edge batteries, mm -hmm. did you actually utilize those yeah. uh, to, pull, to actually recover energy from them and supply? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. We have an algorithm for bi-directional packetizing. So we actually have two types of packets, like a, a discharge packet and a charge packet. Um, and we've been able to show that that works for, uh, for the, the batteries that we deployed. So uh, yeah, so that's, it's working. You had said that 
it's hard to monitor people with their personal solar roof panels. If everybody moved towards a non-grid form of electricity, mm -hmm. supplying electricity to yeah. their own house, yeah. how would that affect the people who then were not, or who are still on the grid if there right. is an increasing number of people who are not on the grid? Yeah, so this is a great question. And so, um, I mean, this, this it, you don't even have to get off grid in order to see this. So that, you know, when um, Vermont utilities are, are fabulous and they've, they've been um, allowing people to, uh, to, um, to do what's called net metering. So they put solar panels on their roofs and then they basically reduce their bill uh, by the amount of solar energy that they produce and zero out their bill. Um, what's weird about it is that the cost, it doesn't cost the utility anything to buy you energy. So the amount of it, other than that one peak summer a day, 99.9% .9 of the days cost them essentially nothing to provide energy. And so the value of that solar that produced is essentially also almost nothing. Um, but they're paying you for it at 15 cents. And so if people, um, you know, if you, a large number of people put solar on the roof, the, they have to then average the cost of operating the grid over all of the other customers who are also, or actually paying their electric bill, which then raises rates, which then gives people more incentive for putting solar on their roofs, which then raises rates further. So this, this process of like solar, then rates going up, and then more solar, and then rates going up further is, is called the utility death spiral. And it's a real challenge because, I mean, I love solar. I mean, I, you know, hope that everyone has, has solar on their roofs. Um, but it's, we haven't figured out the financial model to make that work um, and still have the poles and wires. One of the options is to go off grid. So people just say, hey, I'm fed up with this. I don't, you know, California electricity is twice as expensive as it's here, and it's expensive here. And so people are saying, I'm fed up with this. I don't want to deal with the fires. I just want to separate. And so they do. But then everybody else um, who probably don't have as much money as the person who decided to go off grid has to pick up all the costs of running the system. And so it's, it's a really tricky circumstance that we're in because um, you know, most people don't have the money to build that off grid system. Um, and we're still not really sure that you, I mean, when, what happens to those, all those off grid systems when we have two weeks of not much sun? Um, you're going to be without power. And so, so it's, I'm not sure it's really a good idea for everybody to go off grid because you're going to push all the costs to really low income people. And I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, but what we really need to do is to figure out a good economic model for sharing. And so that's, you know, in some ways, what we're trying to do is come up with a better way so that we can share the resources of the grid. Um, and, and that's part of what we're doing. Yeah. What sort of research have you done into um, alternate methods of organizing the grid itself, not yeah. just managing energy consumption to match um, to match supply, but like I read an article about um, with the onset of renewables, grids need mm -hmm. to start thinking about being built from the bottom up rather than top down, yep. as you were saying. What yep. sort of... Uh, how have you looked into that? And yeah, it's a great question. So I, I'm, I'm really, I think that um, actually what we're really trying to do here is build a, a software platform to enable the bottom-up grid. I mean, this is, this is uh, enabling every single small device to do what, you know, giant natural gas plants are typically doing. And so we're democratizing the system by enabling, you know, millions of small devices do what a handful of giant co corporations typically do. Um, and so, so that's, that's really the vision, is democratizing the system. Uh, we've also, the, another way we've looked at that is, is in developing rate structures. So you really need to have, in order for this to work, we need to be a little bit more creative about how we charge people for electricity. Um, so right now, you know, what's expensive is not the energy that's delivered to your house, it's the capacity of, you know, the generators and the transmission lines, all that stuff that was built to serve your house. And so we need to be more creative about how we charge people so that they have the incentives to do the right thing. Um, you know, especially for EV, EVs are a really good example. So it costs the utility almost nothing if you decide to charge your car off the grid. As long as you don't charge 
in, during those peak hours. And so we actually, uh, Burlington Electric here is a real leader in this space. They um, were working with us to actually essentially provide half price electricity if you'll put one of our smart devices on your, on your charger so that you don't charge during the peak. Um, and that half price electricity is like essentially 60 cents a gallon, which is awesome. So I, I think we just need to be more, be more creative. Time. I think uh, when we last spoke, uh, you had talked about one of the challenges uh, on the economics for the system was actually tracking who got paid among this very sure. weird yeah. system. Yeah. Um, and one question was, is there a blockchain application? So there are about uh, 500 blockchain energy startups who are working on that, and they're almost all dead. Um, <laughs> and I mean, we, we're watching blockchain. It, it, when there is a legitimate bus business case for doing blockchain and energy, we'll totally jump on board. And how, how but, else could one try to organize yeah. a terribly complex? I mean, so there are places we're going to need a ledger. And so the question is just like, is, it a, is a distributed ledger, ledger better than a centralized ledger? Um, and I, you know, I don't have an... Yeah, thus far, there's no reason. I mean, you know, utilities use Oracle databases. They work fine. People kind of hate Oracle, but they work fine. Um, and they're probably cheaper than trying to build giant server farms to mine, you know, to do the Bitcoin mining and whatnot. So thus far, I haven't seen a bit, bit business case for um, blockchain, but that's not to say that's not there. I mean, I, you know, I'm, we're definitely watching it. I mean, blockchain is really valuable when there's a fundamental lack of trust that can't be solved in some other way. Or a uh, fragility of the system where you want the ledger distributed. Yeah. As long as you can have backup on the centralized database. That's true. Yeah. So, um, other IoT devices and programs have been facing uh, kickback from the com from communities and the public just based on uh, right. the IoT issues that yep. like have been brought up already. Yep. Do you have any plans to um, encourage users to get past to those worries, or do you have anything that sort of abates those worries? Yeah, as far I mean, as we work works? really hard on IoT security, so we've put state in the state of the art systems. You know, our devices have encryption on the chip. Um, there's TLS 1.2 with certificates on both sides, and uh, so we've done a lot of work to make the system as secure as, as we can. Um, and we're going to have to continually monitor that system because the standards are changing and, and attack vectors are changing, and so um, we're you know in the midst of a continual upgrade process, trying to to figure out you know stay ahead of the state of the art. Um, so, I, I mean, that's the best you can do, and, and utilities are under, they're actually coming around to this idea that they have to deal with IoT whether they like it or not. I mean, the, the thing that they're really worried about right now is not our devices, because we're small, but the PV inverters. Like, everybody's PV inverter is, a, is an IoT device right now. And, you know, they've got their phone app that allows them to see what their inverters are, you know, their, their solar plant is doing, and that you know, in Vermont, that is uh, the cumulative rooftop solar is the biggest power plant in the state. Uh, and if they lose that, it's it's disaster for the grid. And so, if if someone figured out how to hack all the PV inverters in the state, um, that would be a really big deal. And so, it, it that's that's the risk that I'm most worried about. And I think utilities are are working on it. I, I'm not sure that there's a good answer because those the you know the the margins on those things are super low. They drive the cost down low. So there's, it, yeah, that didn't answer your question, but it's a, it's a real problem. <laughs> I know that you said earlier that you're working with kind of multiple different business models. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on like right now in the short term, yeah. what your most promising business model is, and then how that might change as you guys yeah. scale. So um, I wish I had a good answer to that because we're trying like four different things. I mean, the biggest thing in the industry that we're doing is, is going to a model that's called pay for performance. And so, I mean, utilities are extremely risk averse. And so what we're really working on is a, uh, a model in which we basically sell no risk stuff to utilities. So like, instead of trying to sell them, like give us a whole bunch of capital and then and a SaaS fee um, and, and we promise it'll work, like that, that process is super slow because yeah, we're a startup. Um, but telling them that, like, here, we built this much resource, and let me show you the data. It's actually working. 
Um, we're going to build some more of it using capital that we've raised elsewhere. And if it works, you should pay us. Like that is pretty promising. And utilities are actually really uh, doing a lot of that pay for performance work with energy efficiency utilities like Efficiency of Vermont and others like Clear Result and others around the country. And so we're basically leveraging that, that model. Um, and initial indication is that that'll move things faster. But it is hard. Energy is a, is a big old business and it's super hard. Do you ever think there's a, there's a, a future, and I know it might be a distant one, where like, the individual consumer would care enough about their own consumption and management of electricity that you could sell directly, you know, devices directly to consumers that maybe have your top solar and yeah. batteries? Um, not for the sake of altruism. I mean, there are a few people in this room, like we all super care about this stuff, most of us probably, but like ordinary people have better things to worry about than their energy appliances. And so we need to find a way to compensate them. You know, if they're going to take an action, like, um, you know, install a device or something, I, I think we need to compensate people for that. And so, so there's got to be a way, a financial model involved. Now, whether that looks like the traditional utility, I don't know. So Texas, for example, has a very different model for utility. Again, Texas, innovator. Uh, they, they've, they have what's called retail competition. So they basically, there are utilities that are coming up with their own rate structure and they compete for customers just like, you know, Coca-Cola competes for customers. And, um, and some utilities expose people to the real-time fluctuation of wholesale energy market prices. And so one moment your electricity could be one cent and the next moment it could be a dollar. And, um, and, and so if you, you know, if you had one of those rates, you'd want to put a whole bunch of IoT devices in your house because otherwise your electricity is going to be crazy expensive. Um, so, you know, we, I'm not sure that that's the right solution because people, I, most ordinary people don't want to have to be exposed to that type of fluctuation. Um, but we need to try different things and there's got to be some financial model involved. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Fantastic. As you mentioned, there's been this group of passionate, you know, IoT, you know, enthusiasts here at Generator and watching Andrew, you know, prototype and do the first run of build yeah. for your product has yeah. been fascinating. It's awesome. But more than anything else, it's, it's great to see how small ideas like that can scale yeah. to yeah. save the world. So it's fantastic. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.